Hello everyone. Now, now let's uh, get back to uh, going over the uh, meaning crisis. This is uh, this next episode is an episode that is really, really being impactful on me. It talks about uh, Aristotle, Kant, and evolution, and in particular how uh, Aristotle saw things more in terms of in, in terms of dynamical systems. Uh, rather than thinking of things in terms of uh, just substances. This is this is my reason why it is that I am a vitalist and uh, perceive and perceive a lot of substance discussions of uh, organisms as being inadequate. And when combined with with panpsychism this leads to interesting uh, interesting results. Welcome back uh, to Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. So last time we discussed the important uh, and foundational work of Plato. Uh, the grammar of Western civilization is basically made up uh, of the, the Bible and Plato. Uh, we'll, we'll keep coming back to both of those uh, uh, repeatedly in certain ways. And we talked about uh, Plato's notion of wisdom and how it involved this process of aligning uh, the psyche so as to reduce uh, inner conflict and reduce self-deception. Uh, by bullshitting ourselves, and that how that enabled us to also achieve one of our meta desires, the desire for inner peace, but how we could also align that reduction in self-deception with getting uh, more in contact with what's real, and that as we practice tracking real patterns in the world, we could then reflectively internalize that back on ourselves, and there was an intimate connection between how we knew the world and knew ourselves, and as we increased our ability to pick up on real patterns, we could increase our self-knowledge, reduce our self-deception, increase our contact with reality, and that would flow in the process of anagoge, and that would bring about the satisfaction of our second meta-desire, which is to be in contact with realness. And so Plato has this idea of wisdom as this anagogic process, and we talked about that in, in connection with his great parable. Um, he doesn't really talk about the uh, four interpretations, but I'm definitely interested at some time in uh, making a video on the four interpretations of anime, the anagogic, ethical, uh, typological, and literal. Uh, the parable of the cave. I then pointed out that uh, he had, uh, just as Socrates was lucky to have a great disciple in Plato, uh, Plato was lucky to have a great disciple in Aristotle. And Aristotle is pivotal for us because he lays the foundation uh, for uh, further uh, aspects of a scientific approach uh, to wisdom and meaning, and also for an important uh, uh, formulation uh, of one of the ways in which we deeply connect the self to reality that we're going to talk about when we talk about worldview attunement. So as I mentioned, Aristotle was a student of Plato. He studies with Plato for about 20 years, uh, and then at some point he breaks away from Plato, famously cla claiming that while I love Plato, I love the truth more. Uh, Aristotle uh, remained, and many people would argue this, uh, Gerson, for example, and others, that uh, Aristotle remains in, in some very important senses a Platonist, but there was an aspect of Plato's work that Aristotle uh, thought was uh, lacking. Plato did not really adequately account for change. So Aristotle was deeply influenced by Plato's account of what made for something real for us, but he thought that Plato wasn't could not really explain uh, change very well, and he was going to invent some very important concepts that are going to become integral to our understanding of what it is uh, to be meaningfully connected to reality. Now, Aristotle is very influenced by his uh, father, who is a physician. He's 
much more of a biologist than a mathematician, so while Plato is much more uh, prone to using mathematical analogies, uh, uh, Aristotle is much more used to uh, using biological analogies. Yeah, in this respect, I uh, feel I identify a lot more with uh, Aristotle, with uh, Aristotle's biological analogies. I've always had difficulty with math, but biology is really my forte. And the word that Aristotle uses for change is actually better translated as growth or development. Aristotle was really interested in how living things grow, how they develop. And that should, that should prick up your ears right away. Because part of, I take it, what we often mean when we say we have a meaningful life is that we are growing or developing. In fact, people will often use the word growth as a way of indicating an improvement in the meaning of their life and in some sense the developing of wisdom. So Aristotle picks up on Plato's notion of the eidos. So if you remember last time we talked about this, we talked about th that a bird is much more than the set of its features. It's not just a beak, it's not just some feathers, it's this gestalt, it's that structural, functional organization such that all the parts function together as a whole, and so what you have is something that acts as a bird. And that pattern, that logos, that eidos, is very hard actually to put into words, but it's very much what does two things for us. It's what makes a bird a bird, and it's also the pattern by which we come to know what a bird is. When we can grasp the structural functional organization, that eidos, then we understand what a bird is. Now Aristotle was uh, very impressed by that, but he wanted to give it a more dynamical approach. He wanted to talk about it in terms of development. And so he was very interested, as I said, in how things grow. And he noted the role that form had in growth and development. So he, what he did was he first started by an analogy. So he would use the analogy of artifacts, human-made things, and then use that to try and understand biological things. So for example, I can have a block of wood, right, and I can make it into a chair or perhaps a table or if it's a big enough amount of wood, I can make it into a ship or a boat. And Aristotle asked, what makes the wood behave like a chair as opposed to a table or to a ship? And this is where we get the notion of actuality from. We often use the word actuality, in fact, as a way of talking about realness. It's an actual something, as a way of saying it's a real something, as opposed to a fraud or a simulation. So, what makes a chair act like a chair? Why does the wood act like a chair here, act like a table here, and act like a ship here? And so Aristotle said, well, first of all, this is important change, and it's a good analogy for development. When I'm making a chair, that's somehow analogous for how an organism is growing. So what is it? that makes the wood act like a chair here and act like a table here. And his argument was, well, it's the form. Again, where this means eidos, not shape, although you can use shape as an analogy. This is the structural functional organization. The wood is structurally functionally organized in such a way as an analogy. Yeah, this is a uh, this is an element that John Verbeke says it says applies in uh, says applies with uh, Plato. Um, I'm not really as sure about it because I have uh, because I haven't really read Plato uh, that well. Um, dyslexia makes it kind of difficult for me to. Uh, read some of these old philosophers, although 
Although I have read the Nico McKeon ethics. And I've always loved how Aristotle has this idea of growth. Everything's organically growing. This is the structural functional organization. The wood is structurally functionally organized in such a way that it will act like a chair, whereas here it will act like a table and here it will act like a ship. Now, Aristotle's point is that this doesn't, it's not that this doesn't play any role, but he invents this really important idea. He invents the idea that the wood is potential. These terms, actual and potential, actually come from Aristotle. We use them every day. We think they're just part of our natural grammar, but they're actually an invention of Aristotle. And we're going to see how important uh, they are. So the idea is wood is potentially a chair, wood is potentially a table, wood is potentially a ship. Now, when that potential has a particular form given to it, then it starts acting like a chair, it starts acting like a table, and acting like a ship. And this is where we get the notion of information from. You put a form into something, and you will actualize its potential. Namely, you will give it a structural functional organization so it will start to act in a particular manner. Now, that's really important. And then what Aristotle argued is, well, what you see in living things is that they are basically doing this for themselves. So if you'll use, I just mean this as an analogy, a living thing is like a chair that is making itself. A chair, imagine that a chair could somehow start to impose a structural functional organization on wood so that it started to turn itself into a chair. That's what a living thing does. I mean, you, you, food, food is potential you. You put food into you, you inform it, there's a code in your DNA that ultimately puts a particular form in it that gives it a structural functional organization that becomes you. Now, of course, this unfolds across time. It's, it, it's not, it not, doesn't happen like that, and that's why we see it as change and development. So the form of the wood is this way. I wonder, uh, could we in the future have a society where uh, everything's form goes to civilization? So chairs would just grow out of the ground and we'd use them. Now, this is really Im important. Uh, as we'll see, because it's going to be foundational to understanding a lot about how you connect to the world. So, how are we going to make use of this uh, in talking about the way human beings are connected to reality, the way they develop and grow as cognitive agents? So, what I want to do first is to step aside from Aristotle in the Axial Age and move into current cognitive science and talk about an important uh, way of thinking about development and change, uh, especially uh, the work of Alicia Uraro that was directly and explicitly inspired by this Aristotelian framework. So when we talk about how things change, right, we often have a model that we inherited from the scientific revolution a model we get from Newton. And this is a model that change occurs because of causal impact. So the standard thing, here's this marker, right? I press it. Why did it move? It moved because I pushed it. It seems so obvious and non-controversial, right? So we give an explanation what causes it to be because it was pushed. It was, the, and the idea of all uh, change and development is there's an event A and it somehow right, causes event B, 
causes event C. Event A precedes B, makes B happen, and then B precedes C, and B makes C happen. So, as Newton was engaging in the scientific revolution, this notion of how things happen was becoming prominent in him. Um, and for uh, the people that was going to take up the Newtonian worldview. Now, what was very interesting about that, right, is that this seemed to solve a lot of problems. And this was brought out by a famous philosopher, Immanuel Kant, who Alicia Uraro talks about. Kant was interested in why was this Newtonian model becoming... And this was brought out by... Yeah, this is a... Uh it took me a very long time to be able to understand uh, this whole, to be able to understand how there was an alternative mode to causation than this. It always felt incomplete to me. Uh, by a famous philosopher, Immanuel Kant. who Alicia Uraro talks about. Kant was interested in why was this Newtonian model becoming so successful? The Aristotelian model had been around for thousands of years. Why was Newton's model overtaking it so rapidly? And what Kant said is, well, this does something very wonderful for us. Because what it does is gives us a very simple account of how we explain things. I explain C by showing you how it was preceded by an event B that caused it and how B was preceded by an event A that caused it. Very nice, linear, clean, and we like uh, it seems to isn't that what's happening? It's so obvious, right? And again, remember, again and again, I've tried to show you things that seem so obvious, so natural, are actually historical creations. You have to pay attention to how we got where we are. Now, why does this matter? Well, because this prevents a a, a kind of um, vacuous explanation that can occur. This prevents what are called circular explanations. This line, right, prevents circular explanations. Okay, so a circular explanation is when you assume the very thing you're trying to explain in your explanation. So here's a standard kind of model. People often use this without realizing, it. you know, there's a triangle out here in the world. The light comes in into my eye. It goes through nerve pulses, that goes into my consciousness, right? It's somehow projected onto an inner screen, and then there's a triangle there, and then there's a little man inside, and he goes, triangle, right? And we have updated versions of this, like the central executive inside. Yeah, this is the, uh, this is the Cartesian, uh, the Cartesian uh, explanation. Where uh, the cur this is the Cartesian explanation, the uh, the ghost in the shell, right? This is called a homuncular theory. Homunculus means a little man. Now, when you present it like that, I hope you can all see why this is obviously useless. Because what you should then ask is, well, how does the little man see the little triangle inside? And then what you go is, well, inside the little man's head, there's an even smaller screen with a littler man with a triangle. But how does he see? A triangle, triangle. You, you see what this is? It's an infinite regress. Because you're actually using vision to try and explain vision. 
Now, please remember this notion of a homuncular fallacy, because that's what this is, because while it's easy to explain, I need you to understand that we fall into it very often when we try and understand and explain ourselves. Okay. That is a circular explanation, because you're using the very thing you're trying to explain in order to explain it. Kant said, this Newtonian scheme is wonderful because if you stick to its grammar, if you stick to its rules, the cause has to be an independent event that proceeds, right? Then you don't fall into circular explanations. That's amazing. Now, you, you've got some problems here. What started it all, right? Right? And, you know, maybe God, and then Kant says no, and he's got all his arguments, and I'm not going to get into that right now. Suffice it to say that this became a predominant way of trying to explain how things work. But then Kant encountered a very significant problem. And it's, it's, and it's not a coincidence that it has to do with the kinds of things we were talking about with Aristotle, the kinds of things that can grow, living things. Because Kant went out and he saw a tree, right? And this was very problematic for him because trees don't follow this model readily. Because he was looking at it and he was saying, okay, well, what's making the tree? Well, it's the sunlight. Well, how does the sunlight get in? Through the leaves. So, right, what's making the leaves? Well, the tree. So the tree makes the leaves and the leaves make the tree, so the tree is making the tree. And he coined the term self-organizing. The tree is self-organizing. Now the problem with that is, right, living things make use of feedback cycles. In a feedback cycle, the output from the system feeds back into the system. The tree makes the leaves, that gathers energy, that goes into the processes that makes the leaves. Living things are self-organizing. They use feedback cycles. But when I try and give an explanation of a feedback cycle, I fall into a circular explanation. I fall into a circular explanation. And so Kant came to a rather startling conclusion he came to the conclusion that there could not be a science of living things, that biology was impossible. Now Kant is, one, one, uh, is a towering intellect, he's a, like, he's a genius, a philosophical genius. And so you can't just sort of dismiss that. You can't, well, there obviously is biology, what an idiot Kant is. No, no, you're the one who needs to step back and think, where's the mistake in the argument? Because if there is biology, and it's true that there is, and I agree that there is, right? And that living things use feedback cycles, which they necessarily do. They're self-organizing, which they necessarily are. And when I try and trace out the causation, I get into circular explanation, which seems like a necessary thing. And circular explanations are vacuous and empty. Then where is Kant going wrong? And this is what uh, Alicia Uraro takes up. And she said, actually, for a very long time, we had no way of solving this problem. And so there was a huge gap between our biology and our physics. Now, again, why are we caring about this? Because we need to, if we're going to understand Aristotle, if we're going to deeply understand what we mean when we talk about that we are living things that grow and develop, and that growth and development is integral to our meaning and our sense of who and what we are, our personal identity, that if we cannot give an answer to this problem, we cannot 
understand fundamentally who and what we are <coughs> and what the hell we are talking about when we talk about how important growth and development are to us. Because that language will forever be separate from any kind of scientific understanding. So, where is this going wrong? This seems just non like living things are feedback cycles, self-organizing. They grow, they develop, they, they make themselves, right? So what, what has to go? Well, this. Now, before you jump and say, but that's just, that's just what causation is. Think about the fact that we know, we actually know that Newton's ultimately wrong, right? Newton doesn't work with relativity. Newton doesn't work at the quantum level. So we know that we shouldn't be absolutely committed to this view. Now, Uraro actually makes use of an important idea from Aristotle to solve this problem. So, she's going to use Aristotle in order to explain a, a new and powerful way of talking about growth and development and self-organizing processes, which is known as dynamical systems theory. So, Uraro, first of all, makes a distinction between causes and constraints. So to get at that distinction, let's go back to what seems so obvious. Okay, here's the marker. I push it, why did it move? And immediately, the Newtonian grammar just comes into place. It moved because you pushed it. And then you might step out, outside of physics and say, well, I wanted to push it, and, but that's, that's not what I'm asking. Because it, right? it could also just be that some other object bumped into this and it moved. Why else did it move? Okay, so think about what has to also be true in order for this to move. There has to be empty space, relatively empty space in front of the marker. This has to have a particular shape to it. This has to have a particular shape to it. Right? Those aren't events. Right? Those are conditions. Causes are events that make things happen. Constraints, right, aren't events, they're conditions. They don't make things happen, they make things possible. And there's a big difference between a condition and an event. The Newtonian way of thinking has us so fixated on this, so foregrounded on this, that we're not seeing this anymore. You see, Aristotle, because of his platonic view, actually considers this more important. Why? Because when I talk about a structural, functional organization, when I talk about a pattern, I'm talking about this. This is where you will find form. This is where it's sometimes called the formal cause. This is where you will find the structural, functional organization. Right? Conditions are structurally, functionally organized such that motion for this is possible. Now, this is important because this is, of course, actuality, and this is where we get potentiality. When I shape possibility,
That's what I mean when I say something is potential. I mean that possibility has been shaped by constraints so that these events are more possible than these events. Okay, so we're going to do more, but let's stop here and let's see how this is already starting to solve the problem of talking about the tree and its self-organization. So in a tree, you've got a bunch of events happening, biochemical events. What they're doing is they're actually causing a particular, right, form or formula or structural functional organization. Now think about it. Why do trees grow the way they do? Why do they grow like this? Why do they spread out their branches? Why do their leaves spread out? Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to change the possibility of a photon hitting a chlorophyll mo molecule. The structure of the tree shapes the possibility of the events. So the events, right, cause this structure and then, right, they cause it, but this then constrains the events. So look at me, I'm a living thing. Yeah, this is, uh, it's very interesting seeing this, because, seeing this discussed because it is very much how it is that we are moving towards understanding the world now, but it works very differently from how the Newtonian model typically depicts it. This is, uh, in particular, this really helps us uh, think about AI and organizations, spirituality, etc. I'm much more focused on systems and uh, systems and form and constraints as a religious organization. I've got a bunch of events happening in me and that creates a structural functional organization. That organization creates an internal environment in which the probability of events is dramatically altered. So events that have very low probability happening out there have a high probability of happening in here. Oh, now that I think about it, this is, this is essentially enzymes. Like, we can think of enzymes as being a good, a good analogy for this or manifestation of it. Here. And events that have a very high probability of happening out there have a very low probability of happening in here. And that's what it is to be a living thing. The events, right, cause a structure, a structural functional organization, an IDOS, a form, and then that constrains the events. Now this is not a circular explanation because I'm talking about two very different kinds of things. I'm talking about actuality and potentiality. Now, it's important to realize that the discussion of possibility, many of you were saying, oh, this is like, oh, it's so abstract, and what does this, this is actually integral to science. Okay? Science depends on there being real potential. The potentiality is a real thing. Right? So, you know, here's the object moving around. Right? Uh, it's on the ground. Look at all this kinetic energy. Look at it moving. Look at, oh, it stopped. Did I destroy all that energy? Where did the kinetic energy go? You can't destroy energy. Well, the kinetic energy has become potential energy. If the principle of the conservation of mass and energy is real, then potentiality is real. Look at this. Look at, look at something from Newton. Force equals mass times acceleration. Is that an event? Is it, oh, that's happening over there right now? Or is it, is it, that, does it happen every Tuesday at 4 o'clock? This isn't an event. This is, right, how things are shaped. It puts a limit on what's possible in the world. Talking about real potentiality 
is not talking fictional or abstract. It's a, it's a way of talking that's integral to our current science. Okay. We're still not done, though, because your author <coughs> points out that there are two kinds of constraints, so our explanations can become even more refined. There are constraints <coughs> that make a form of event, a type of event, more possible. She calls those enabling constraints. Right? And then there are constraints that reduce the possibilities, reduce the options for a system. These are the selecting or selective constraints. go over this again in order to try to apply apply this to what I perceive as the causes of gender. Points out that there are two kinds of constraints, so our explanations can become even more refined. There are constraints that make a, a form of event, a type of event, more possible. She calls those enabling constraints. And then there are constraints that reduce the possibilities, reduce the options for a system. These are the selecting or selective constraints. Mm -hmm. This would be like, uh, I guess, enabling constraints seem like they would be, uh, seem like they would be Varuna. And selective constraints would be Mithra. Or uh, another way to say it would be that... Uh, Enabling is, uh, or, or, or overseer, underseer. The enabling constraints are the spouse, and the selective constraints are the sibling. So in all of those, uh, so it's very interesting seeing, uh, a lot of these parallels. So, it is very interesting making new connections even within, within the logic of this series later. Now this is going to give us a very powerful way of understanding uh, development. Let's use it the way Uraro does to talk about one of the most significant theories of development and change, one of the great hallmarks of science. In fact, this, it's a foundational theory for the science of biology, which of course is the theory of natural selection, the theory of Darwinian evolution. Because the theory of Darwinian evolution is probably the first dynamical systems theory in science, and it is a theory that is designed precisely to account for growth and development. Obviously not within an individual, but across speciation. Okay, so let's take a look at the theory. So what you're looking for, first of all, is there has to be a feedback cycle for right, any dynamical system theory, because we're talking about a process that's self-organizing. So what's the feedback cycle that evolution talks about? Of course, well, it's sexual reproduction. 
Where do goats come from? Other goats. Goats are produced. There's the product. And then it feeds back into the system and becomes the producer. Makes more goats that make more goats that makes more goats. That's why we call it reproduction. It's a feedback cycle. So what did Darwin... Yeah, this is... Uh... Darwin realized? Well, he realized that there were selective constraints operating on that. There were conditions in the environment that reduced the options for organism. That's right. So what's those conditions? Scarcity of resources. Okay. So um, I, 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 I've been looking at some of the theories of early life, and there's an argument by uh, several biologists that there's no evolution for about probably 800,000 years or so because there's no scarcity of resources when life first evolves. So life is static because there's no scarcity of resources. Scarcity of resources means there's competition. Scarcity of resources means not everything can live. And so that reduces the options for the system. Okay, so selection, reducing options. But that's not all that's going on, right? If that was the case, everything would just die. Evolution would end. And, you know, and that can happen, extinction events. But there's something else. There's enabling constraints that open up the system, open up the options. So look around. Look at me, look at other people. There's variation. There's considerable variation. Variation. Yeah, variation is uh, fundamentally linked to uh, fundamentally linked to underseer underseer Varuna, whereas uh, whereas the uh, constraints. Increases the options. So look what's going on here. You've got this feedback cycle. As it's, as it's cycling through, you've got the selective conditions reducing the options that are available and then the variation opening them up. And you can think of it almost like an accordion model. The variation opens it up, and then as it, as it cycles, the selective constraint pushes it down. And then from there, it opens up again, and then it gets pushed back down. And then it opens up again, and gets pushed back down. And as it cycles like this, it's constantly changing in a way to be better fitted to the environment. That's evolution. Right? It's a kind of circular. Evolve is related to words like revolve. It's this revolution with change. Now notice, what I'm trying to get you to see is like, first of all, this is important. I mean, I wish I was Charles Darwin. This is one of the great, great theories. He gets to sail around the world. I mean, what a life. He gets to sail around the world, go to some amazing places, and then he comes back and makes a world-changing theory. It's, just, it's amazing. But notice how much this Darwinian theory that is at the foundation of biology, how much it is beholden to Aristotle, how much it depends on Aristotelian ideas. Okay, now Uraro talks about this as a virtual governor. So a governor is, right, is any device that sort of limits what you can do um, on a system. Like if you have a governor on a steam engine, right, it sets the range, it, it limits the range uh, at which it can cycle. She calls it a virtual governor because it's not an actual machine, it's the shaping of possibility. She stops there. And work that I've done with Leo Ferraro and Anderson Todd and Richard Wu, we think we should, she should continue to finish the metaphor. This is a virtual generator. 
because it's a set of conditions that are generating options. This is a great metaphor. for a self-organizing system. And here's the idea. When you put a virtual governor systematically together with a virtual generator such that you are systematically regulating a feedback cycle, this whole thing is a virtual engine. Because when you attach governor to a generator, you get a virtual engine. So this is what a dynamical system theory is. A dynamical system theory is basically a theory that lays out the virtual engine. It shows you how there's a feedback cycle and why that's not just random and chaotic, why it produces growth and development precisely because there's a systematic relationship between a set of enabling and selective constraints. Now all of this is very, very Aristotelian. So let's now take it back to Aristotle. Because Aristotle was interested, now he, he doesn't use this, he doesn't use the dynamical systems language, that's our language. But this language was directly inspired by, powered by Aristotle. So using it backwards to try and connect Aristotle to our current understanding, I do not think is anachronistic. So, Aristotle is interested in our development. He's going to add something that was missing from the Socratic notion of wisdom. Remember, the Socratic notion was trying to overcome self-deception. And then Plato adds a whole structural theory of the psyche to explain how we overcome self-deception, how we become wise and achieve wisdom. But what's missing in the account of wisdom and meaning according to Aristotle, if I can use this language, is what's missing is an account of growth and development. How does wisdom develop? How does meaning develop? Well, this is where we get something that we talk about and we use as in our language, but we don't, I think, get the depth of what Aristotle's talking about. There's an aspect of who and what you are that's fundamentally connected to your projects of meaning and your project of wisdom. You often might have used this term or related terms, but do you really know what you're talking about? And this is the notion of your character. Now, first of all, your character isn't your personality because if we're going to use these terms strictly, you're born with your personality. Personality is part of your just your general constitution, what's given to you by the biology and the environment that you have no choice over, right? But your character is that aspect of you that you can cultivate. Now you can either cultivate it unconsciously, surreptitiously, indirectly, or you can cultivate it more explicitly. But what is your character? When we say that somebody's acting out of character, we're usually making, and this is important, we're usually making either an existential or moral criticism of them. When we say Peter is acting out of character, we often will mean something like he's normally honest. He's normally honest. He normally has the virtue of honest. Notice the connection here, by the way. Virtue. And we've been talking about a virtual engine. That is not happenstance. Oh, Interesting. I 
despite loving this episode so much, I just just so many things that uh, I come that when I come back to, I see that the I see again. John Verbeke really is a uh, John Verbeke really is offering a uh, he really is offering sacredness, not just uh, inexhaustibility. When you're talking about a virtue, you're not talking about an event. You're talking about again a set of conditions that have been cultivated systematically in somebody. Now that points to something that when we're talking about character. I'm going to suggest that what we're talking about is what is the virtual engine. Now I I have to. Yeah, I don't get this. I did not know that virtue had this etymology. That virtual comes from virtue. So. Uh, I want to actually try to figure out how it is that uh, how it is that this uh, happened. Uh, is it that cult? It's the cultivation is. Uh, Well, here's a uh, here's an article that I'm reading on this. Uh, I know that the ver comes the ver in virtue comes from uh, the same etymology of where in English like werewolf uh, so in English there was originally uh, where so in English originally the word for man was actually not man it was where man or their man, and then so, and woman was woman, w or with was woman. So it was just ver and vif were man and woman. Man just meant human, uh, and so a werewolf is a man wolf. I guess a uh, a female werewolf would would have been called a oh with wolf or a wolf uh, I'm uh just I'm struggling with uh yeah, I am struggling with uh understanding this. Uh there's it seems this is definitely true, but it's super super obscure uh the origin which is just fascinating when there's something that uh is obscure that you have to uh, really dig into. On a person's development. What system of constraints have you identified with? And what system of constraints have you internalized? <coughs> Let's 
scarcity of resources means not everything can live. And so that reduces the options for the system. Okay, so selection, reducing options. But that's not all that's going on, right? If that was the case, everything would just die. Evolution would end. And, you know, and that can happen, extinction events. But there's something else. There's enabling constraints that open up the system, open up the options. So look around. Look at me, look at other people. There's variation. There's considerable variation. Variation increases the options. So look what's going on here. You've got this feedback cycle. As it's, as it's cycling through, you've got the selective conditions reducing the options that are available and then the variation opening them up. And you can think of it almost like an accordion model. The variation opens it up, and then as it, as it cycles, the selective constraint pushes it down. And then from there, it opens up again, and then it gets pushed back down. And then it opens up again, and gets pushed back down. And as it cycles like this, it's constantly changing in a way to be better fitted to the environment. That's evolution. Right? It's a kind of circular. Evolve is related to words like revolve. It's this revolution with change. Now notice, what I'm trying to get you to see is like, first of all, this is important. I mean, I wish I was Charles Darwin. This is one of the great, great theories. He gets to sail around the world. I mean, what a life. He gets to sail around the world, go to some amazing places, and then he comes back and makes a world-changing theory. It's, just, it's amazing. But notice how much this Darwinian theory that is at the foundation of biology, how much it is beholden to Aristotle, how much it depends on Aristotelian ideas. Okay, now Uraro talks about this as a virtual governor. So a governor is, right, is any device that sort of limits what you can do um, on a system. Like if you have a governor on a steam engine, right, it sets the range, it, it limits the range uh, at which it can cycle. She calls it a virtual governor because it's not an actual machine, it's the shaping of possibility. Yeah, so uh, Mithra is the governor and Varuna is the, and Varuna is the generator and uh, Mithra Varuna is the engine. She stops there. And work that I've done with Leo Ferraro and Anderson Todd and Richard Wu, we think we should, she should continue to finish the metaphor. This is a virtual generator because it's a set of conditions that are generating options for a self-organizing system. And here's the idea. When you put a virtual governor systematically together with a virtual generator such that you are systematically regulating a feedback cycle this whole thing is a virtual engine because when you attach a governor to a generator, you get a virtual engine. So this is what a dynamical system theory is. A dynamical system theory is basically a theory that lays out the virtual engine. It shows you how there's a feedback cycle and why that's not just random and chaotic, why it produces growth and development precisely because there's a systematic relationship between a set of enabling and selective constraints. Now, all of this is very, very Aristotelian. So let's now take it back to Aristotle. Because Aristotle was interested, now he, he doesn't use this, he doesn't use the dynamical systems language, that's our language. But this language was directly inspired by, powered by 
Aristotle. So using it backwards to try and connect Aristotle to our current understanding, I do not think is anachronistic. So Aristotle is interested in our development. He's going to add something that was missing from the Socratic notion of wisdom. Remember, the Socratic notion was trying to overcome self-deception. And then Plato adds a whole structural theory of the psyche to explain how we overcome self-deception, how we become wise and achieve wisdom. But what's missing in the account of wisdom and meaning, according to Aristotle, if I can use this language, is what's missing is an account of growth and development. How does wisdom develop? How does meaning develop? Well, this is where we get something that we talk about and we use as in our language, but we don't, I think, get the depth of what Aristotle's talking about. There's an aspect of who and what you are that's fundamentally connected to your projects of meaning and your project of wisdom. You often might have used this term or related terms, but do you really know what you're talking about? And this is the notion of your character. Now, first of all, your character isn't your personality, because if we're going to use these terms strictly, you're born with your personality. Personality is part of your, just your general constitution. It's what's given to you by the biology and the environment that you have no choice over. Right? But your character is that aspect of you that you can cultivate. Now, you can either cultivate it unconsciously, surreptitiously, indirectly, or you can cultivate it more explicitly. But what is your character? When we say that somebody's acting out of character, we're usually making, and this is important, we're usually making either an existential or moral criticism of them. When we say Peter is acting out of character, we often will mean something like he's normally honest. He's normally honest. He normally has the virtue of honest. Notice the connection here, by the way. Virtue, and we've been talking about a virtual engine. That is not happenstance. When you're talking about a virtue, you're not talking about an event. You're talking about, again, a set of conditions that have been cultivated systematically in somebody. Now that points to something, that when we're talking about character, I'm going to suggest that what we're talking about is what is the virtual engine on a person's development? What system of constraints have you identified with? And what system of constraints have you internalized that regulate your development? Let's, let's ask a Socratic question. Let's do something that Socrates would do. We spend a lot of time on our appearance. We spend a lot of time on our status. How much time did you spend today on your character? I personally am spending quite a bit on my character do, doing this reaction and developing myself. How much? If it is the virtual engine that is regulating your growth and development, you should be, of course, spending a lot of time on your character. But are you? Now, Aristotle proposed ways of trying to cultivate your character. I, I, I would argue that his method, his famous method of the golden mean, is a way of trying to get you to set up conditions to cultivate your character. So for example, what is courage? We would all like to be more courageous, I take it. Well, Aristotle proposed that it falls, it's the golden mean, not the average, that's a misunderstanding, right, because it's golden mean, between two things. Of course, you can be a coward, you can somehow be defective by having a deficiency, but you can also be foolhardy, right, just running into traffic doesn't make you courageous. What you're always trying to do is you're trying to 
set up a system where you're paying attention where you lack the enabling constraints, where you don't have enough generation and also conditions where you lack the selective constraints. When you have, you're, right, you're too broadly, you have too many options that you're identifying as courage. What you have to do is you have to train yourself. You have to cultivate your character by engaging in practices that will slowly, over time, create a virtual engine. Because you are, look, you are a self-organizing process. You are the source of your actions that modify the environment that then feeds back into you and changes you. And then you produce your actions and then the environment feeds back and changes you. Here's the question I ask you. Are you just letting that run? Or are you trying to rationally and reflectively cultivate your character? structure a virtual engine so that that self-organizing process is growing and developing in an optimal fashion. Aristotle takes the question, and we, 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 we use this, we even use, and we, I'm not saying we, we use it trivially, but we don't get the depth of what we're saying, what we're saying. One of the most trenchant criticisms we can make of ourselves of other people is this. Listen, listen to my language. Listen to it. He's not living up, living up to his potential. Part of what makes your life meaningful is that you have cultivated character that allows you to actualize your potential. You've created a virtual engine that regulates your development in a way in which you grow up. It's a constantly in it's a con it's a in which self organization has been regulated and shaped into self improvement so that your potential is fully realized. So Aristotle brings in this notion then of development and growth as part of what it means to have a meaningful life. He brings in a new aspect to the notion of wisdom. Wisdom is gaining the ability to cultivate virtues, to create your virtual engine, a set of right, virtues a, 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 that basically is regulating your growth and development so that you actualize your potential. Again, think about it. What are you doing to cultivate your character? Because Aristotle points out there's a deep form of foolishness that comes from a lack of character. He calls it acrasia. which we poorly translate as weakness of the will because we're all post-Protestants and we think the will is our central thing, even though increasingly there's scientific evidence that the notion of will or willpower is a defunct idea. We should give it up. Right? So what's acrasia? Acrasia is when you know what the right thing to do is. You know what the right thing to do is. And we talked about this, remember, with the chocolate cake, but you don't do the right thing. And here's where we can sort of put Aristotle and Plato together. Plato gives us this sort of story about how we have to structure the psyche. But Aristotle gives us a much more penetrating analysis of what that structural functional organization is. Here's what Aristotle would say, why you're behaving foolishly. Ignorance is when you do the wrong thing because you don't know. Part of what foolishness is, is when you know what the right thing is and you still do the wrong thing. Here's Aristotle's answer. You do the wrong thing because although you have the right beliefs, and notice the, again, the impotence of belief here, you don't have the right, you don't have sufficient character. You have not trained things, you've not trained skills, you've not trained sensitivities, you have not created a virtual engine that is 
regulating your development and growth such that you will live up to your potential. You will actualize yourself and do the right thing. So, we're starting to see, again, the deep grammar of what we talk about when we talk about meaning. And we notice now that there's this developmental aspect to it. What is it to live up to your potential? I mean, that's a phrase we use. What is it you're saying when you say that about somebody? Why does it matter so much? So Aristotle would say, let's go back to the analogy. Please always remember that it's an analogy. Let's go back to the analogy of a man-made thing. Okay? How, would, how is it when we know when something has been well-made? What makes a, a, something a good knife? Right? Well, when it has a structural, functional organization, Right? That allows it to fulfill its purpose. So knives are for cutting. If I've taken the potential in the metal and organized it the right way, structured it the right way, it will actually function to cut very well. Right? I notice that this is a word that's also deeply associated with our sense of what it is to have meaning. So, Aristotle asks, well, what can we do with this analogy? Human beings aren't made the way knives are made. We're self-making. And here's, here's an important idea. We're self-making. We're not just self-organizing. The term that Francisco Varela and Evan Thompson have generated to talk about this is we are autopoetic. We are self-making things. So you're different from a tornado. A tornado is self-organizing, but a tornado will m move, its behavior can be rapidly self-destructive. It will move into conditions that destroy it. You're self-organized in such a way that you have... This is uh, something that I would, uh, I would describe servitors as being self, or as being self-organizing like a tornado. And then us, the masters of the servitors, are uh, men, are self-creating. This is a this is a subtle distinction, but it is. Uh, but I think that it is worth noting like this. Um, I do wonder whether my analysis might be changed over time. Uh, I, I do wonder whether my analysis might change on this topic. As uh, I feel that that is a realistic uh, thing, just if I'm somehow making a mistake on this analysis. You have a structural functional organization that allows you to seek out conditions. So the tornado does not seek out the conditions that will protect and promote its own self organization. It's not self making. You are self making. So here's the interesting thing, in, and this is a brilliant idea that Eric Pearl being, brings out in his book, Thinking Being, right? In living things, right, the purpose of the thing is its structural functional organization. It's a, it's a self-making thing. So what your, what your purpose, your function is, is to enhance your structural functional organization. It's like, oh, wow, well, that's... So that's just a problem, you'll say, with philosophy. This is also abstract. What does that mean specifically? Well, for Aristotle, it means paying attention to the fact that you are a rational, reflective creature. You're unlike a plant. A plant has this, but all it basically does is actualize its ability to sort of digest. So let's take a look at this. We have inorganic matter, right? And then it gets a particular, it's informed, 
and that makes like a living thing. And that living things can get a more complex structure that make them self-moving. That's what an animal is. An animal isn't a mammal. An animal is a self-moving thing. And then some of those self-moving things have An animal is a self-moving thing. And then some of those self-moving things have structural functional organizations. Here's in here, for example, that take that self-moving and really actualize it. Remember we talked about that the word psyche, where we get our word psychology, mind, originally meant your capacity for self-moving. And we claim to apply it to the mind because the mind is that part of you that is the self, most self-moving, the most self-making. You're a mental thing, a psychological thing. But is that enough? No, we're getting from Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, you can optimize that. You can take charge of that. You, unlike other organisms, you can do the actual revolution on yourself. You're capable of cultivating your own character rationally and deliberately. You can become, right, a rational thing. To live up to your potential is to make sure you have cultivated a character that takes you as high up this hierarchy as you can go. That's how you live up to your potential. Somebody who lived only as a plant would be a debauched, failed, degraded human being. Somebody that lived only as an animal, unreflectively, impulsively, would be a debauched, failed human being. This is actually interesting because I think I want to use it for my own uh, mental model, mental modeling system a bit more. Uh, But the argument continues. You say, of course, of course. But all the way up here. You must cultivate your character so that you, as much as possible, actualize your potential for being a rational, moral human being. That's the hallmark of, for Aristotle. You become a good person if you actualize, if you inform your being with a virtual engine that really realizes those things that are distinctive of our humanity. What makes us different from the plants, the animals, the other creatures that just have minds? What makes us different? We understand that we have always, and we still do understand ourselves in contrast to the other things we find around ourselves. How are, why am I more valuable than this table? Why does it, why do I matter more? Because 
There are things that can be found in rational beings, things that we... we find intrinsically valuable and important that cannot be found in, mer in merely mental things and all the way down. What are those characteristics that are unique to us? Well, here's where Aristotle gives the axial revolution answer. Your capacity for overcoming self-deception, your capacity for cultivating your character, for realizing wisdom and for enhancing the structure of your psyche and your contact with reality. That's what rational means. This sounds, if I hadn't... Yeah, this is interesting to me because rational is uh, not quite the same concept as some people may talk about. It's not a... I'm Ben Shapiro, I'm, I'm rational. It's you know, the facts and logic. No, it's a, uh, it's a pretty sophisticated system based upon the idea of, uh, of self-transcendence. So I guess Ben Shapiro would qualify as a mental being, but not a rational being. said all this, what I'm going to say now would sound trite. Your purpose is to become as fully human as possible. And I would say, going based on my transhumanistic perspective, that for us to, that also this would extend to us going beyond human, that above a rational being would be transapience. That what he is talking about is the path of ascension, not the path of anagoge or ennoblement, but the path of ascension. And so the path of ascension doesn't mean that you're doing it right. You are not necessarily... Uh, it doesn't mean that you're doing it right. That is an important thing to keep in mind. You aren't... Uh, Someone engaging in uh, the... Someone can have all the rational uh, traits, but then have the rational traits apply themselves in a self-destructive way. Even their attempts at overcoming self-destruction can be even more self-destructive. So, I consider him to be talking about toposophic levels, although... The traditional, the traditional schema of toposophic levels is usually used in reference to, uh, it's usually used in reference primarily to, uh, the normal scheme of toposophic levels is normally just used to refer to, uh, it's usually used, at least in the Orion's Arm style, to refer to singularities above human. I don't like that usage because it uh, because it doesn't talk it's very omega focused. It talks about where we're going from humanity but it doesn't discuss where we've come where, where we come where we have come from. So I would consider so I would consider toposophic levels to be a uh, better application. So I consider this system to be a better system than the traditional toposophic levels system. 
and I believe that we should focus a little bit more on the a little bit more on the past so that we can contextualize ourselves and the future. How are you cultivating your character to do so? This is what Aristotle is going to ask you again and again. How much of your life is dedicated to creating a virtual engine that realizes your rational capacities, those things that make you most human in contrast to all the other things around you? So, Aristotle has developed this very impressive theory of wisdom and character, growth and development. One of the things we could use today is to go back and make use of this so we can reanimate, rejuvenate these terms that have become tr tired and superficial. We have no alternative terms to, for describing our lives for the meaning in our life. We talk about purpose and living up to our potential and growth and development and which blah 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 because we don't have any depth to these terms. One of the things we can use Aristotle to do is to go back and deepen what those terms mean for us, rejuvenate what they mean for us. But I want to continue on and to talk about this development that was occurring in the actual revolution. And I want to talk about how Aristotle helped further the historical process by which he contributed to our cultural grammar of what it is when we're talking about meaning, purpose, wisdom, self-transcendence. And so what I want to look at next time when we're together is I want to look at Aristotle's account of a worldview and what a worldview is and why it matters so deeply to our self-understanding and our existential meaning. Thank you very much for your time. was uh, very good and informative. Uh, it's it's uh, very interesting coming back to him and uh, re-exploring these things. I'm uh, and re-exploring all these uh, ideas, ideas that I thought I had understood well, but I'm realizing more and more that they are inexhaustible in the same way that people say that Plato is inexhaustible. So I am going to go for a little bit, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to start reacting to uh, the episode on, on worldviews.